All right. That you may know, dealing with biblical apologetics, we're using the we're using the book uh, Foundations uh, Two, um, and if you have your book with you, or if you have it online, uh, you might want to open to uh, page twelve. Um, and if you have your little chart, we're going to be explaining that and looking at this chart some tonight also. If you don't have that little chart, it's on page uh, 17 of, or 18 of, of your books. Open your Bibles <clears throat> real quick to get started tonight. To 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We had, we've pointed out that if you wanted to put the modus operandi or the mode of operation of how Satan works, you can sum it up in one single word. And what is that word? Do you remember? Deception. Deception. Deception is making that uh, which is not real to look like real, that which is fake to look real. Um, uh, and the closer you can make it look real, while at the same time frame it is not real, the greater will be the deception. It is said that when people are trained uh, at banks or the treasury department to spot counterfeits, that they never study counterfeits. They only study the real, so that when you see something that doesn't match the real, you know immediately that it's a counterfeit. This whole apologetics course is about knowing what you believe and why, and then be able to defend it, so that then all of us will be able to recognize deception when it's presented to us. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. He says, oh, let us read it, verse two. <clears throat> for I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband. That is, every church age believer is set aside to become the bride of Christ. Now, whether or not they can become that is a different issue, but we've been set aside for that. So he says, so that I might, pre uh, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. That's a pastoral intent. Intent. It goes along with Colossians 1, 28 and 29, which is the pastoral mandate. Uh, that is why we do what we do at Westside. That is why uh, we are trying to help every way we can with those who are in other countries to train them so that the pastors know what their work is. The idea of presenting you as a pure virgin is one who will be able to fulfill their destiny as the bride of Christ. Now, of all the things that Satan does not want, he does not want you to be an inheritor of the kingdom, a ruler of the universe. The reason is, is because that is what he wanted. He tried to take by force, tried to take by rebellion, that which God intended for mankind. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, he took away the right to rule, uh, and through the outworking of the angelic conflict, um, he is still attempting to be able to, to prove that he can run the world better than God can, and that, uh, that he has the right to rule. Um, the way he does that is through deception. Deception started uh, in the Garden of Eden, verse 3. But I'm afraid that as the serpent, that is, that is the devil, Satan, deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Led astray is what happens with deception. And notice it is by craftiness, sneakiness. It looks as though it is good. It looks as though it's true doctrine when indeed it is not. But also 
we know that as we get closer to the end of the age, not only is deception going to be on the rise, but so is pressure from outside forces attempting to persuade Christians not to be uh, firm in their faith, not to be, if you will, conservative. Conservative means you accept the Bible as absolute truth. Instead, they want you to go along in order to get along and avoid pressure and avoid persecution. As persecution gets closer, uh, we here even in America, much less other places around the world, are going to have to be firm in the faith and know what we believe and why we believe it, or else we will fall into the traps of Satan that would be described as deception. So he says in verse four, for if one comes and preaches another Jesus, he didn't say preaches Muhammad. He didn't say preaches Buddha, uh, you know, but another Jesus whom you, whom we have not preached. Now, another Jesus is a Jesus that looks like the real Jesus, but isn't. How do you know what the real Jesus is? By the word of God. There's many people in the world today uh, that uh, do not believe the correct things about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, many uh, believe or will say things that uh, by scripture twisting and deception that um, um, Jesus was just a man who became a God. That's Mormonism. Or Jesus is a created angel. He is an archangel. That is Jehovah's Witnesses. Or you could go on down through with uh, um, uh, with uh, Hinduism or uh, even Theosophy, as it's called. Um, you'll find that uh, it, he was he's a an ascended master. Uh, he is an avatar. Uh, but you know the whole idea of Jesus of the Word is rejected by all of them. So it's another Jesus. Now those are some dramatic examples. But then there's also common in the world today, the Jesus who offers you eternal life if you can keep it. Offers you eternal life if you can keep it. Because you see, if you sin too much or sin too long, he'll simply take back his gift of eternal life. So you're not really receiving eternal life as a gift. You're receiving it on probation. As long as you're good enough, you'll be okay. Beloved, that is a different Jesus. That is not the Jesus that said, he who believes in me has present possession, everlasting life. Let's go on. You receive a different spirit whom you have not received. Now you, at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, you receive the Holy Spirit. So the other, only other spirit that you can receive is a deception from the satanic cosmic system. You have, are believing wrongly and then he goes on or a different gospel which you have not accepted it's a different it's different doctrine than what needs to be taught and look then his comment on it you bear this beautiful they were fighting against paul who held forth the truth and then those that were coming in preaching of a different jesus and a they're coming out of a different spirit and a different gospel, let's say, as we know in Galatians, a works-oriented gospel. Um, he said that they bear with that beautifully. That makes them feel good about themselves. Uh, and he goes on to defend his apostleship and so forth. But you see, where that came from was a, ser a serpent deception, a satanic deception. That's why... The theme verse for this whole course is 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense, apologia to everyone who asks you to give an account, a logos, or in other words, to, to give a word, an explanation for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So why do you need this? So that you will know truth from error. In John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, if you're my disciples, you'll be in my word. And if you're in my word, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's a paraphrase. The problem as we have seen is that 
Christians are increasingly unfamiliar with what they believe, why they believe it, what is important to believe. Many focus on externals in the churches and not doctrine, and we do not know why it is important. So now let me advance this. By the way, along the line, we're going to be adding some uh, materials from, from time to time. If, 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 an, if I do this, I don't know that I will, but if I do have an entire class that's going to be a, be a video, I'll let you know a week in advance. But speaking of videos and spiritual warfare, yes, sir. Just one question. One of the things that Jesus revealed himself in the Gospel of John is the truth. Yeah, exactly correct. Jesus is the truth. We cover that, I think, in our first class. But yes, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And they would have other Jesuses. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you have your little chart, I want you to do something for me. You got your little chart? On the far left-hand side of that chart, if you hold it this way, you're, it would be on your left as you're facing it. I want you to write the word spiritual warfare right there. Spiritual warfare. You're going to be adding to that chart a little bit here. Spiritual warfare. And that's why we have this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God that you, uh, that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the spirit. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly take down the mystery of the gospel for which I am in a master in truth. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Spiritual warfare. Literally, it is Star Wars. It is Star Wars because the... The fallen angels in the scripture are sometimes referred to, well, all angels are sometimes referred to as stars. The questions of life. Beginning in verse 12. Verse 12, listen to me, page 12. We have seen in the first two lessons, who or what is the ultimate cause of all things and why is there a need for absolute truth? We're going to start today on God or matter. And we're going to work through the chart, show how it works. As we go through there, we're going to cover all the rest of these points. And I don't know if we'll get through all of it tonight, uh, but we're going to make the attempt on all of the different ones that are there. Okay? Hang on. Let me get past this. This is, I forgot to move something. There we go. All right. On your chart, on the left-hand side, you're writing the word spiritual warfare. If you look, there's two boxes there on the left-hand side. And this is point C on page 12. You have to make a choice. It's a reasonable choice. It's a logical choice. But still, you have to come to the correct conclusion. That's why Paul warned about people coming to the wrong conclusions and bearing it beautifully because they were not thinking through what they had been taught, rather they were being deceived. So with the chart, it begins with either God or matter. God 
divine viewpoint, right? The DVP over top of God. And matter is HVP, our human viewpoint. Also, you can write SVP for the satanic viewpoint. But like links in a chain, each one of these connects to the others. But the first one you have to come to grips with is God versus matter. You see, that ball just went rolling all by itself, didn't it? No one, no one threw it. Did nothing happened, right? No? You can bring it back up here. Yeah. Come on. Thanks, Hunter. I know you'd rather go back there and bounce it off your Aunt Marsha's head. But... How come when it was launched, everybody started looking at it? Well, here's just a simple, basic scientific fact. For every effect, there is a cause. For every effect, there is a cause. That ball didn't suddenly just appear out of nothing and start rolling. As a matter of fact, I didn't make the ball either. I don't know who did. Somebody. It's a cheap one, I'm sure. For every effect, there is a cause. So in other words, someone or something is eternal. It has no... He or it has no beginning. It's either faith in a person or a thing. That's the foundation of what you have to decide. You have to look at the evidence and the scriptures, look at the evidence in the universe. Romans 1, uh, go with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, beginning of verse 18. Romans 1, 18. Uh, you can write in your Bible, Psalm 82, that's a counterpart to this passage, Psalm 82. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. You suppress something that is there. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. In other words, within every person, they know there is a God. They may deny it. They may say, no, that's not true. Whatever. They can try all they want. But put them in a foxhole with explosions everywhere, and they're close to death. And nine times out of ten, they'll shout something like, oh, God, help me. But I thought you said he wasn't there. Didn't exist. Right after they shout that, they'll say, hello, mama, or come help me, mama. But God made it evident to them, He within them and to them. How did he make it to them? 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. It's both in Every, every human being to know there is a God. And then the created order itself tells you that. But many people want to say, no, matter is eternal. Just the gods of evolution are time and chance. And something came from nothing and life came from non-life. And they say, that's science. You see, true science is thinking God's thoughts after him. True science has to begin with God. If those who choose to believe in the eternal God, they realize that he is the uncaused cause. An uncaused cause. In other words... People will sometimes say, well, what caused God? Nothing. Because God is eternal and has always existed. In the beginning, God. God was already there before anything else was in the material world. But there will be those who say, no, we're just going to have to have matter. But 
How could that which is not alive suddenly become alive with a functioning design? That's a good question you have to ask. Even atheists, when they're so-called scientists, are looking at it and say, well, it looks like design, but it isn't. That's like saying, well, that car looks like it was manufactured somewhere, but it wasn't. It just happened. You know, I think in today's world where 90% of the culture is crazy, even they would even lock that one up. Matter or God? If you think that matter existed, that, that is, takes greater faith than to believe in God. That matter just happened. And that out of chaos came order. That there was a big explosion. I've said this many times over, but let's do it again. And that is, if you were to take and, and, and do a carpet bombing of a, um, of a, of a wreck yard of cars, when the dust cleared, you will not have a brand new Mercedes Benz sitting there. Can I get a witness? Of course. I mean, you know that. I know that. How many, how many uh, ladies in here knows that your house does not clean itself? Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And, and why is it that we've got a couple of men who are maintenance men here? If, you know, because things don't fix themselves. Things break. But if matter is eternal and out of all of that came, why do we have to keep doing these things? So after that then comes either revelation that will tell you what things are. In other words, the what is it? When you look at things in the world, when you see the creation as it is, then the question would be, do I know what it is by revelation or can I learn everything that I need to learn simply by observation? For example, the structure, order, and design of the world, for those, it has no meaning, it just exists. Now, follow me. Why do you think so many of our young people are committing suicide, killing themselves on drugs, or going out and shooting up the schools? It isn't guns. You know what the foundational problem is? Life has no meaning. Why does it have no meaning? You are just, you, 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 you just came from a little bit of ooze millions and billions of years ago, so it's the ooze to you. There is no meaning, no purpose in life, um, nothing. So you have to rely on your personal observation. Now here's another question. How many in here have observed everything there is to see in the world and you know everything there is to know? Anybody here? Other than teenagers. <laughs> Sorry, Savannah. <laughs> See, if you believe the creator is the conscious being, then ultimately you would have to believe that he chose to reveal himself. That's revelation. It's logical. He did choose to reveal himself. The most important pursuit in life, if you know that there is a creator, is to find out what he revealed and what it means. That's in the word of God, but also in the scientific pursuits that are out there. Science is wonderful when science is thinking God's thoughts after him. True science does not contradict the Bible. I'm going to say it again. True science does not contradict the Bible. Mm -hmm. So then the next step would be inspiration inspiration and that is is it reasonable to believe that 
when you look at everything that is, that there is a God. And that he revealed the truth. And he revealed it in such a way that it would be without error and it would be able to communicate in the languages of the people. That is the word of God. The earliest portions of the scripture, I firmly believe, were written by Adam himself. Actually, the first part of it by God. You have in there what are called the, these are the generations of, you go back and look into it in the, in the book of Genesis. All of those, I believe, were written by those that when they say in the generations of, those are called the Toledo passages. Those are the sections that were written by those people at that time frame, all the way back before uh, the flood, right on down through. All of that wound up in the hands of Moses, who then compiled it, put it together through inspiration, wrote it, wrote it all down. But I also believe that God is always a writing God, so that even back then they were writing. They were writing before the flood. God, God didn't, didn't have a bunch of monkey people. They wrote because our God is a God that communicates. So it is without error. Inspiration can be trusted to search for answers to the major issues of life since it is that which has been communicated by the creator himself. You still with me? You see how the lines are starting to follow. If you are following the divine viewpoint, you're going to be working off that top line. If you are following the satanic viewpoint, human viewpoint, you're going to follow the bottom line. And as you look down through there, you can see it leads to nothing but trouble. The, if you choose not to believe in the creator or choose that he did not reveal himself, then only your own perception from observation is what you have to rely on. I remember a story from many years ago where there was a, a who was, I think it was Harry Ironsides, but anyway, was riding on a train and got a conversation with the guy, told him who he was. And the guy said, ah, I don't know about this God thing. Said, if I can't see it, I don't believe it. Ironside kind of smiled at him and said, do you believe you have a brain? He said, yeah. He said, you ever seen it? It's a good question. If you want to see it, I'll cut the top of your head off and pull it out for you. Now, he didn't say that, but if it had been me, I would have. David Burris probably would have gone ahead, pulled out his knife and started slicing it. Gosh, kidding. <laughs> You see, perception is subject to change because it'll just differ from person to person. You can't even have a car accident with five witnesses and get five people saying the same thing. So perception is not trustworthy. You can learn things from it, but you have to recognize the limitations that there are there. So if you are honest, then all you're going to get out of that is doubt. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, everything within you, and do not lean on your own understanding. You're not God. You're not omniscient. You don't know everything. Let me ask another simple question. People want to ask these kind of things. Let's see. Let me, uh, who am I going to pick on tonight? Let's see. Uh, I'll pick on Bruce. Uh. Bruce, have you ever made a mistake in your life? <laughs> Not only 1 John 1, 9, but, you know, everybody that votes that Bruce should no longer be a deacon, say amen. <laughs> yeah. So everyone here has made an error. Have there, has there ever been a time in your life you thought something was true and find out later it wasn't true? So if you think then that you know that there is either no God or it's all happened by evolution and revelation, the Bible can't be trusted or anything else like that, then what you are saying is, I know everything there is to know and I've never been wrong. And if you say that and you have been wrong, you're trusting something that has been proven to make mistakes. 
That's pretty dangerous. Yeah. Don't you think? You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the center of truth. The test of truth is focused on Jesus. Why? John 1, 3. John 1, 3. Look at this. See, here is, we. if we know, acknowledge that there is a God who has created and he has revealed to help explain the world to us, and by inspiration, it is infallible. Then we also have to accept this. And that is John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. Who is the word? Look down at verse 14. And the word became flesh. Who is that? Oh, the, come on. Come on, class. Who is it? The Lord Jesus Christ. All right. In the beginning, in the beginning, when all of the created order was started, God was already there. The word was already there. Before anything was created, we're going to talk about some of this stuff Sunday morning, but before was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, not a God, as Jehovah's Witnesses would try and modify saying oh we know the greek no you don't nobody in the nobody 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 agrees that the new world translation is a valid translation it is not a version it is a perversion Amen. new world translation is jehovah's witness bible it says the word he was with god and the word was god and the word became flesh he's the god man so everything focuses in because Jesus is the God who became man. You would not know that except for what? Revelation and inspiration. You can have total confidence that that's who he is. That's why people that fall into deception begin to doubt who God is, begin to doubt, uh, and they don't have any more confidence. The next thing, then once we have come that far on this chart, keep looking there, come over to the, the third column of the purple. If you know that there is a God and he has revealed himself, he has inspired his word, then the next thing we need to know is, what does he want me to do? Not trying to read what I want in his word, but what does he say? What does it mean? What does God want me to do? to do. Now, if a person, a believer, comes this far, and then when they realize that God wants them to do something that they don't want to do, and they rebel against it, they have now moved from humility over to arrogance and self-will, how do you straighten that out? Well, you got to go all the way back to God versus matter. Do you believe God really exists or not? Do you believe in the revelation and inspiration? If so, then it's the author's will. Now you can do yourself will, but when you do, who are you now following? It's Satan. You're following the human viewpoint, which is the satanic viewpoint. And that is arrogance. The I, I love when I, I have talked to people many times. And they say, well, I don't, okay, I'll click on this one. You don't have to come to church to believe in God. Well, that is absolutely correct. And you don't have to come to church to worship God. Well, that's also absolutely correct. But the scripture also says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, that Christ himself is the head of the church and God the Father formed the church. We are the body of Christ. We are to participate. We are to be there. He's placed pastor teachers to help to train us. From here, we do evangelism. That's the whole thrust of it. But now instead, we want to try and play let's pretend and say, no, I don't have to be there. Well, what did you just do? You just got arrogant. You just said, I don't, you know, I know what God said, but. And, oh, here's my, fa here's my favorite one. Well, God understands. <laughs> Yes, he does. Yeah. And you 
are missing the fact that he does understand and you think he's agreeing with you and he ain't. That's good Southern English. He ain't. <laughs> Amen. So what do you have to do? You've got to go right back and make the decision again. Does God or matter exist? Because if you think you can live independent of God, you're really believing that there really is no God to whom I am accountable. clocks who invented time anyway oh you did sorry <laughs> you see for a believer you can you can fall into self-will and arrogance god's given you first john one nine to put you back into humility it takes humility to admit i was wrong Amen. you were right But sometimes when we have been in rebellion and arrogance for a long time, now we have to go through the process of repentance. Yes. And that is to confess it and to take active action to correct it immediately. And to go before the Lord and to admit, I have been in arrogance. I have been acting like the devil himself. And I'm turning from that. So that's that is repentance. Simple first John 1 9 is okay. I know that that you know I hit my thumb with a hammer and and I said something about you know somebody's parental background. And um <laughs> you know, and so you confess it. It's something else to be living in self-will and arrogance. You still with me? Yeah. <laughs> the results. What kind of results are we going to get? If we are dealing in truth, then we're going to have an assurance. An assurance that we are walking in truth and we know what truth is. That is what apologetics is all about. We know that we know that we know. And we know why that we know. We can have that um, love of the truth and, the, 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 and, it, and it will not turn us away from the truth. Nothing is going to turn us away. But if we're following matter, what are we going to have? Deception. From that deception is going to come nothing but anger, fear, and guilt. That's believer or unbeliever. Uh, there is nothing more miserable in the world than a believer who has been out of fellowship for a long time. Absolutely miserable. Those are the results. You know, it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that when we're following along that top line, what's going to happen? Go with me. Romans chapter 12. You got Romans open. You should have still. Romans 12. You know these verses. I Therefore, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren. See, Paul was very aware of our tendencies to fall into deception and self-will and arrogance. Therefore, I urge your brethren by the mercies of God, because of everything he's done for you, to respond how? To present your bodies. Present your bodies. Now, last Sunday, we talked about surrender and dedication. Here's the presentation of your body. Because you see, you live in the world and you connect with the world with this physical thing called your body. Present your bodies how? A living and holy sacrifice you we begin to look at things differently and we begin to be recognizing the fact that there's things that other people may do or think or have own that we are not going to do we can't do because we're holy we're set apart to god a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to god 
which is your spiritual service of worship. It puts it here, your reasonable service. It's only logical. If there is a God who is the creator and he's revealed everything through the inspiration of his word and you know what his will is, you're living in truth. It is only reasonable to respond to that positively. And it truly is worship. It's acknowledging who God is. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. To be transformed. It is your reasonable act of service to the Lord. And how are you transformed? The renewing of the mind. That's the way it works. You see, for a person who has followed so far on all of this, um, their lives will change for the positive because they're filled with the Spirit. They're advancing in knowledge and truth and understanding. There's going to be positive changes. Listen, for every believer, there's going to be changes. That doesn't mean they're always positive because believers can rebel. You, but remember what we've said? You're either moving forward or you're moving backward. You're never standing still in the spiritual life. So the question always is, which way am I going? Now, the issue and the problem for people who follow with the human viewpoint and all that line that goes down there is that instead of changing themselves, they want to change the world, try and better their life. Sometimes it's, I just got to get a better spouse. I just got to get a better job. I just got to get a better car. I just got to get a better house. I just got to get a better, get a better, get a better, get a better. And then everything's going to be fine. But you know what? You're never happy with that. It's never enough. Like John D. Rockefeller one time, somebody said, you're, what, you're the richest man in the world, or nearly was, whatever, at that time frame. So the, how much more do you want? He just said more. Just more. You're, you're never satisfied. But sometimes they want to change the world. That's why they get involved in causes such as radical environmentalism. I'm going to save the planet. Look at me. Woo! I recycle my cans. You need to recycle your can. Go get in the grave. But anyhow, I didn't say that, did I? They want to try and be, they would try and manipulate society so that it looks like they think it should. They, they, they think socialism is the way to go. They believe that government authoritarianism is going to bring paradise on the planet. They're even into thing called transhumanism, which tries to maneuver your genetics, tries to connect you to machines, um, even to the point that they're now talking about the hot, the um, the hive mind, the hive mind, and that is they put the computer chips into everybody's brains, so that then they can give us the information that we'll all learn to just think alike. Remember the old commercial: "We all bond." <laughs> And what are we supposed to think? Well, what they know is good. Why? Why it makes them good? Well, they're educated and they're the elite. And they just push the buttons. They, you think I'm joking you. I'm not. They're, think, they're, they're working on those type of things. They're trying to change the world. And I'm out of time. I told you I wasn't going to finish this. I was close. I want you to take your chart and do three things for me. Do something for me real quick. I want you to write three words across that top line up there somewhere. Two lines of belief. Along the top line that begins with God, write the words freedom. Freedom. Reward. Satisfaction. Freedom, reward, satisfaction.
along the bottom line, write three words. Slavery. Loss. And frustration. Slavery. Loss. Frustration. And don't misunderstand the chart. The bottom chart or the bottom line doesn't mean an unbeliever because both believers and unbelievers can follow the bottom line. So don't lose track of that. All right. I will have to finish it a month from now. All right. We're going to go to our prayer time. Let me stop the uh, recording.